Good afternoon, Dublin. It's a pleasure to be here for two reasons. Number one, doing my talk. But number two, listening to all the great talks that you've heard today. Absolutely fascinating, really enjoyed it. So no pressure then, let me get started. What, what am I talking about today? I'm talking about mobile patterns, right? The tiny atomic units that make up the work that I do of optimization and experimentation, right? So that's what it's all about. And I got thinking about this when I was researching. I've been a gardener since I've been 17 years old. And I keep seeing these mathematical patterns in nature, these geometric patterns that repeat in the plants that I grow, the seeds that I harvest, the fruits that I eat. So it's very interesting to know that all of this mathematics and these patterns are driven by evolutionary genetic algorithms and that little patterns go together to make up bigger patterns which make up bigger patterns still. You know, has this got any analogies to real life? But the interesting thing is when you, when you look at these patterns in tiny detail, you can zoom in on the capillary system in a leaf, yet this looks like looking at a set of river tributaries or the flow of water over a landscape. And it is indeed the flow of water, but it's a tiny micro scale. So there are these micro and macro patterns that exist both in my work, but also in nature that inspire me. And this is one of the best examples. This is a Romanesco broccoli, right? Just like normal broccoli, a little bit harder, very tasty with a dab of butter. <laughs> but what you can see is that there are these tiny little patterns, which are the same as the big patterns, which are the same as the bigger patterns. And it looks like infinite. Oh, I can go even smaller. Very interesting stuff and very inspiring, but it has a very important real world application, probably one that you may not have noticed at all. And it's this, no, this isn't an acid trip. It's a mathematical <laughs> set. Right, And you can spend lots of time going, zooming in and out of this diagram and going ooh and cool. But what really did fractals do for us? Right, So Mandelbrot, <laughs> the father of this branch of mathematics and fract fractal geometry in particular. So what did this stuff do for us then? Well, there wouldn't be any YouTube. You wouldn't be carrying photos around on your phones because the storage capacity wouldn't be big enough because you wouldn't have been able to compress the images. There'd be no YouTube, there would be no Netflix, there would be no binging on box sets at the weekend unless you've got a 200 meg fiber connection. And the internet itself would have been overwhelmed with this traffic. A lot of the services that we know, love and use today would not have advanced to the stage that we're at. They wouldn't have grown as companies because the underlying transport for all this lovely work would have been massive, huge, honking images, which wasn't gonna work. But this stuff is really good. It underpins computer graphics, virtual reality, statistical mechanics, and even the chaos theory that goes into the financial modeling of complicated systems, even geophysics. And see those little trees when you're flying over a CGI landscape in a computer game or inside a film when they wanted to not spend money on real filming? That's all generated using fractals to make the trees and the plants look realistic, like real life, right? But this is all very interesting, but I want to take a little diversion because there are patterns and changes that manufacturing and retail have been hit with over the years. So even in our 25 years of the web, we ought to think it's kind of internet time, you know. So I can draw some reasonable parallels between what manufacturing has been through in terms of commercial pressures and changes, but also what retail has been through. Can we learn anything from the journey they've been on now that we are doing all this internet stuff? Is there anything that we on the web can learn from people who have had a lot of pressure to succeed before? And the answer is yes. See, one of the things that people look at when they go back in the history of car manufacturing is normally the whole thing comes up about Japanese cars or the Far East or people cost cutting. But the thing that they most ignore from the research I did from this is the orchestration of people and stuff, right? How people are managed, how stuff is moved around, how the whole thing is orchestrated. The guy with the white stick, 
right? And all of this stuff has been what has been driving the efficiency in manufacturing. It isn't robots. Yes, that plays a part, right? But it's this stuff that actually changed the way that we built these products. And that's really important for the web. So we've gone from this really sort of, you know, 50s finish sort of assembly line. It's dirty, it's smelly, it's hazardous, it's injurious. There's lots of risks inherent in the way that this is built. And then we go to the present day where there's an assembly line where there are no humans. It's completely automated. But all of this stuff, all of those methodologies has been towards a purpose, to get the quality up. Anyone own a classic British car from the 70s? You know exactly what I mean. <laughs> Removing defects and waste. St having to recall cars is expensive, right? Fix it before it goes out. Getting your capacity up. Having agility, flexibility and delivery. Being able to manufacture things on demand, not necessarily stockpile loads of things. And, you know, to get this stuff absolutely right. Because if you don't get it right, you'll kill people. And if you don't get it right, well, the, at the very least, you're gonna kill your company or you're gonna kill your customers. Neither are very desirable scenarios. <laughs> but what can retail teach us? You go to John Lewis, you have a wonderful experience, it's absolutely fantastic, but you go into the toilets and it looks like World War III has erupted in there. That's not a good retail experience, right? All this stuff has to work. If the rails are too jammed or close, doesn't matter if the store looks great. You can't see the clothes, you're not gonna put them in your basket, you're not gonna to go to the till. All of these thousands of tiny little details must work without fail for you to have a decent retail experience because you can have all of these and there's a queue at the tills, that's it, all bets are off. And the same is true of internet patterns, but here are the patterns that you encounter in retail. These are the atomic components that when chained together make up what we call journeys or experiences. Get these wrong as an atomic part and you have a problem. The same is true when you're trying to op optimise in a cross-device world. These tiny little patterns, things that validate in your phone number or getting your address right. Like, when are people going to realise that if you can't use the effing address finder, you're not going to send them stuff and it means that they're not going to give you any money. The two are intrinsically linked. If that one doesn't work, you're not going to send them shit, okay? Simple. <laughs> Let's get it right. But here's another good one. What, do you ever see, do you ever have meetings where you discuss what stuff you're going to remove from the website? No. <laughs> no one has any of these meetings. I've never been to one of these meetings. I think we should take these five things off. They're crap. They've never worked, we know, get them out. But you see it in a window display, right? If these guys did stuff like the web, what they would do is they would keep filling the window until it gets to the fucking top and then they'd have a redesign, okay? So they'd wait two years till the window fills the fuck up to the top and then say, window's getting a bit full, think it's time for a redesign. <laughs> you wouldn't do it in retail. So these guys put the stuff in, if it doesn't work, they yank it out, right? Perfect example of performance-led design. But there's a lot of stuff that these guys laugh at us about because they do it way better than we do, right? So don't do your homepage like that. But let's have a look at the crappy state of the internets. And people sort of think my job is, I go and look at a business, I talk to them a bit, I look at their data, I speak to the staff, and that's it. I just point at, ah, oh, there's your problem. That's it, sort that, and everything's cool. No, it's not. They've been reading the long ladybird book. This is a ladybird book <laughs> that I have been reading. <laughs> this is what I really want to say to my clients. It's fucked beyond all recognition. <laughs> I can't do anything with this, it's shit. Please fix it and then ask me back next year, but I can't. It's my job, I have to sort it out. But here's a good example. I'm on a freezing platform in Lewisham, right? I see this advert from British Airways, 
for a landed page, and they advertised it with this visceral imagery, these caves in Madeira. Whoa, 167 quid a person for five nights, including flights. That's good. So I get my phone out. I'm on a crappy 3G signal. Welcome to being on O2 in London. Hmm. So I go to the site. Wham! What happened to all the visceral imagery? So what's the most relevant thing? Oh, there's a terminal move at London Gatwick. <laughs> that's, that's good to know whilst I'm picturing that wonderful cave in Madeira. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I, I persevere at these things. I don't give up too easily. And eventually, two thirds of the way down the page, I find the flight. Again, no imagery, but I kind of guess that that's the one. But I press the button and I get, what is this? <laughs> what? Right, this thing has more options than a porcupine, right? It's, woo, bristling with stuff. But it, it, get, it gets better, it gets better, right? See these things here? I had to get a magnifying glass out to measure them. <laughs> these are less, less than two and a half millimetres in size. I didn't have precise enough measurement to get any better than that, plus minus something. But here's the science bit, right? If you have a tap target that's that bloody small, right, then you are miss taps, right? OK, so there's the science behind it. Let me give you the lowdown. It doesn't fucking work. <laughs> OK, good. Science bit over. Right, back to that's what it looks like. I've got this massive meat finger that I have to move over this stuff like that. Are you fucking kidding me? You spent money on this marketing? Oh, how about I go to the next page? Let me move my massive meat finger <laughs> over the tiny pagination controls. What is going on? Right, it gets worse, right? No, 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 that's not, that's not the worst. It gets worse, you get this overlay to choose your destination, right? But to be able to see the stuff, you have to zoom in, right? But now, what's happened to Europe? Right? With like United Kingdom and Europe, fuck you, right? <laughs> that sums Brexit up, doesn't it? <laughs> Fucking hell. But, but even if I do get to take these, right, how do I press the OK button? Because I can't scroll right to the OK button. So the only way I can click the OK button after doing that is to get the massive meat puppet out again, right? And whap it on the screen. This is just ridiculous, right? Gets even better. <laughs> I was guessing what this copy was. We'd like to take your feedback up our back passage. <laughs> yes, where's the button? Where's the button? Can I click it? I want to give them feedback. No, I can't, I can't. I can only click this one because the right one is off to the right in feedback overlay jail. That's what I call this. I'm in jail. Ah, terrible this one. So they paid money for this. Good marketing money was spent with people to get me to go there. No thanks. Here's another one from Viagogo. This is great. These guys have got more than 47 messages trying to push scarcity and urgency. If you're not terrified that you're going to lose the tickets to some random stranger by the third step that you get in here, I mean, it's ridiculous. You're just shaking by the time I got my tickets. <laughs> but it was a real struggle. <laughs> but it gets better because they're napalming the customers. <laughs> This is that we've been talking about web performance today. This is the best I've seen. This website is on fire. <laughs> We've got a Flamicon. It's suffering meltdown, right? The website's experienced heavy traffic. It's may result in reduced performance. It's negative psychology. That's not going to work. It means that people are looking to find fault. And these guys admitted to me that this was a lie. There's nothing wrong with the servers. So it's not ethical. It, uh, maybe ethics don't come into it. It's just fucking stupid. <laughs> All right, let's try that in my local restaurant. The chef's hung over today. Your food's going to be shit. You might wait a long time. Please take a seat. Enjoy. It's not going to work in retail, and it's not going to work on the web. 
So what did BA and these guys do? They've napalmed my customer experience. They have destroyed the whole forest. I will never respond to another BA billboard again. So they wasted their first lot of marketing and all subsequent marketing is wasted on me. This stuff makes me angry. This is my friend Michael. You wouldn't like him when he's angry. I'm even angrier than him about this stuff though. And he is very angry. But you can screw up single fields as well. And you should go and see Luke's stuff tomorrow if you're around, because I've learned more from reading this guy's stuff about optimizing patterns than anyone else in the world, right? Seriously, you go tomorrow, it will be the best few hours that you spend on this stuff. But why are you asking me to fill in my credit card number with an alphanumeric keyboard? Why have you got fucking spell checker turned on in a field where it's just going to annoy me? These tiny bits of frustration are killers for conversion. And even the evolution of mobile login screens, if you look back at old patterns, and you've got better patterns, and you've got better patterns still, if you're still running on this kind of stuff, then you're obviously not testing enough because Amazon are evolving. They're getting better, right? And that's what you should be doing too. Remember here, Stop saying that these things are one-step checkouts. It's not a one-step checkout. It's not a three-step checkout. It's 27 interaction steps, okay? And think about it as 27-step checkout because you've got to get them. It's like a little dog jumping through hoops. You've got to get it through all 27 hoops before you get the money at the end, right? So work it as 27, not as three. But the fundamental problem that all of this stuff causes, there's another thing gnawing away in here. That is, when I put persuasion here, does persuasion shift the needle? Yes, via Google can put stuff on there to make you feel your tickets are going to get lost, you have to buy them now. And it'll shift the needle, but only a bit, right? Working on and understanding and increasing people's levels of core motivation here, right? They offer the clarity, comprehension of that sort of stuff. That will work, but... It will push the needle a bit more, but still not massively, right? But what's even bigger than that? What can I get to shift stuff further than that? Making sure people can actually fucking use it on their device. <laughs> it's amazing, it'll never catch on, right? But there's one that's even better than that, that'll get you even more money, and that's finding and fixing broken shit. If your front doors don't work on your shop, right, or people can't get their double buggy in through your narrow doorway, they're not going to buy anything. <laughs> so start with that one, because it probably makes you more money than all three of those combined. <laughs> Do you want to know how much? These are figures from defects on major sites that you probably know. In this one case, two and a half million pounds a month was being lost from a minimal number of bugs. And it took less than five days to fix all of this crap. You can do the maths. That's a lot of money, isn't it? And in one case, the money they were losing from the bugs was bigger than the entire budget for the entire IT department on an annual basis. So the challenge to you is, how do you know you don't have one of these in your site? Like a great big brick tied around the nether regions of your business. <laughs> okay. It might be huge, but you don't know it's there until you look. It's a Schrodinger's cat situation. And this stuff is important because an experience is only as good as the crappiest part. And if you try and optimize your site and apply A-B testing, oh, let's put, do some random psychological techniques and lots and lots of shitty A-B testing. Right? Well, what will happen is your turd will become a glittery turd. <laughs> okay? It's still a turd. It just looks like a really cool turd, right? <laughs> if you feel that way, stop doing this. But it's not just web products that are screwed in this way. We've got the Internet of Things, which is going to kill us, kill our families, and kill our pets. <laughs> yes. It is true, there will be headlines. People will be harmed by this and be really serious. It's going to happen. Um, so these guys made the first, world's first intelligent pet feeder. You can feed your pets. Fuck off. Way on holiday for two weeks. Make sure that dry kibble comes out every day. And if they're hungry, you can look at them on the webcam and give them a little more. But wait a minute. Oh, dear. 
we have an issue with one of our third party servers. So you may experience a loss of scheduled feeds and failed remote feedings. No shit. <laughs> Little doggy is going to starve. But hey, some of us work in marketing, so let's turn it into a feature. Holiday diet. <laughs> Holiday diet option. Go away for two weeks, lose four kilos. <laughs> Bit of a problem if your dog only weighs four kilos in the first place. But hey, I'm sure we'll figure it out later on in version two. So we are going to see headlines like these, and you can read more about them when they come out. But this one is actually a real headline. There was a search engine available for hacked baby monitors. So you need to be really careful about this stuff. The Internet of Things is a really stupid idea. People are about to die, and there is very little we can do. You should read this article. It's brilliant. So we have all these flaws that underpin suboptimal products, right? I'm not going to go through them all, but, you know, there's often these n problems gnawing away at the center of it. And a great deal of it, as you've seen from the work of Booking.com, is removing ego from the process. Ego, cherished notion, whims, personal opinions have no place in this design, right? And this is the problem, that much product design is driven by ego and unconscious biases. <coughs> so I'm going to give you 10 A-B testing rapid power-ups and some optimization power-ups, some stuff that you can go away, take away, that will help stop some of that crap that I showed you earlier. So uh, you'll get all the decks, so you'll be able to download this and have a look at it. Amazon are doing lots of testing, but let's show you the kind of figures we're talking about here. Over 1,200 tests a year, over 1,000 live on booking.com. Facebook, there's a 99% chance right now that you're in 10 tests. You don't even know about it. Stuff you're seeing is not the same as the other people in here are saying. But there's an important point here. We always look at those big companies and all the stuff that are testing. But what happens if you haven't evolved to that level where you have that traffic? This is an amoeba. You will not see many of them riding bicycles, OK? <laughs> I haven't seen one riding a bike because they haven't evolved to that stage. If you don't have enough traffic, if you have, for example, less than 500 conversions a month, it's probably not worthwhile to be doing A-B testing because you should be working on your product <coughs> market fit or removing the defects or issues from your product because otherwise you are not going to grow to the size where you can test. So don't do testing if it's going to kill your company because you can't then grow. Stop <laughs> copying. Stop copying shit blindly. It's okay to copy stuff, but you have to validate it. You look at these things, oh, I saw this thing in an article, we should try it. Even though it's a completely different market sector, this stuff is not the same, right? So even if it looks dead obvious, you still have to validate it with UX testing and with A-B testing. There's more reading here. It explains that there are some things that you can copy, but it's a very narrow set of circumstances. And here's a quote from Booking.com. What works for Booking.com may not work for you. Amazing, right? But all of these ideas, all this stuff that you talk about at work, all of these things are unproven until they've been tested against the specific customers on your platform. Don't forget it. So this is a great quote. Stop copying your competitors because they may not know what the fuck they're doing either. <laughs> yep. You could have just copied the shittiest A-B test they've ever run because you saw it on their fucking site. So that makes them stupid, but it makes you even worse. Number three, in your life, you have to get with statistics. I'm reading this book, Statistics for Dummies, right now. Even if you're in marketing, you don't need to know this stuff inside out. You don't need to do a degree course on it, but it's going to be a big part of your life. It's going to be a big part of machine learning. Get with stats. If you want to do this stuff properly, you need to know enough about it to be able to manage and develop the people who do look after it. Number four, run a test calculator. If the answer to how long is the test going to take is nine million years, you may be dead by then. Do something else instead. Testing is trading time and effort versus potential reward. Work out the time and effort bit first before you concentrate on the reward bit. And this is an important point about prioritization. 
Don't just do random testing. You can have lots of test ideas, put them in a bucket, but prioritize them. It's like a triage nurse at a hospital. She wants to work out who's most at risk of dying first and will treat that patient first. And you need to prioritize testing ideas. So score every testing idea. There are uh, two I would recommend, PI and TIR. And then you run the high impact, low cost stuff first. It works. Here's a money model. We estimated how much money all these changes were going to make so that we could concentrate on getting the most money in the bank as early as possible. 4.8 million, it turned out to be worth that lot a year. Number six, does this sound like work? Because our CEO had an idea that nobody else fucking agreed with, we thought that we'd put orange buttons on the homepage because it's, it's more on brand. It'll make people feel funky. <laughs> how are we, we going to measure Funkiness. What is this metric you speak of called funkiness? So you'll have no idea how to measure that and nothing will happen. And this is like normal work. This is what you need. Give this to people and say, please put your A-B test into the sentence or go away in short jerky movements. <laughs> okay, so if your A-B test fits in here, good. I'll have a look at it. If it doesn't, go away until it does. Number seven, record what people see. So we've got all these different brains and cohorts and groups and uh, people that we're trying to appeal to, but then they've got all these devices. Oh yeah, but we've made it really difficult. We've got all these different grid layouts and they could be using more than one. It's like, oh my God, this is really complicated. Simple, do what the Financial Times does and store the grid design layout that they're seeing in Google Analytics, right? Because then you know exactly who's looking at what design. Because if you're A-B testing it, you can't just say, oh, on average, B1. Because B looks different on every one of these different mobile devices. So segment your stuff. Number eight, nobody wants meetings about statistics. At the end of a test, I really want to know three things. Do we put the old one back on? Do we put the new one back on? Uh, uh, do we put the new one on? Do we put the old one back on? Or do we scratch our heads and run another test? That's about it, right? It's a business decision. It's not a stats meeting or a nerd gathering. It's actually about getting a little ticket out that tells me what to do. The business needs decision support. Read this article. It'll tell you how to do it. And here's another example of toxic A-B testing. There is no feeling in the world worse than having run an A-B test that you try to tell everyone about, and then you realize it's all bullshit because the test was broken. It didn't work on iPhones or Safari or some other thing because you didn't QA test the test before it ran. So you've wasted everybody's test time. It's like air guitar for testing. It really doesn't work. Number 10. Test across three horizons. This article, top right, talks about horizons of product development, but it's also true of testing. You're doing a lot of current product optimization. I want to get maximum yield out of the current product in its current iteration, but I'm also working on testing stuff that's going to become the features, the products, the MVP, the add-ons that are going to go in in three or six months. But I'm also doing this whole exploration of Rumsfeldian space, the unknown unknowns, because I don't know what product I'm going to have here, but I sure as hell better prepare for it so I can do testing and discovery here. So some optimization power-ups. First thing is 95% of all the Google Analytics setups I've looked at in the last three years, and that's hundreds of them, are fucking broken in serious ways. And I mean, this is a serious issue. I want to build a tool and give it away for free to audit setups because this is a massive problem. It's not Google's problem either. It's like if you bought a whole load of shitty tills of some bloke who turned up at your store with a skip and then they're not added up correctly after the first two weeks, do you blame the guy who bought the tills off the skips or do you say it's a technology problem? It's not a technology problem. You have to calibrate your tills in a retail store to work out are they counting the lunch money and everything correctly. You need to calibrate Google Analytics. Get an audit now. These are the three people to talk to. Number two, what is your testing list? What is, what is a representative d device mix for your customers? Do you know? Most people say, oh, it's like, 
Oh, I think we've got iPhones and, uh, yeah, there's some of that droid stuff. Yeah, tablets. Yeah, yeah, there are tablets. <laughs> did you just make this shit up or did you actually get the data from Google Analytics? Because if you've got Google Analytics, it will tell you amazingly enough what the devices are that people have in their hands when they come to your site. Wow. <laughs> you can make a testing list. So then you can make yourself a nice little mobile testing lab. And if you can't afford to build one of these, well, you can use cloud ones. So you can test all your desktop browsers, Safari and Chrome and everything else in the cloud. You can test all your mobile and tablet devices in the cloud. These are real mobile devices. I can control an iPhone in Brazil, visit the Brazilian app store, install an app on it, and then send a text to myself in the UK. Fucking amazing technology. No excuse not to be using it. And I don't care whether you build, borrow, steal, or get these devices from friends and family, you must test because there's no other way of knowing whether your experience on these devices is shit or not until you look. Doing rapid usability testing is important. You don't need a lab to do that these days. You have online tools to get feedback on concepts or uh, an entire journey, and you can do all of the recruitment and testing online. You can even do guerrilla testing. So mobile device usability in a lab. I use this one called UX Recorder. I take it out to bars and coffee shops. I bribe people with beer and coffee, and they give me user feedback. And we then take it back to the office. We tear it apart. We reiterate the product, and then we get back out to the pub again. It's brilliant. I love my job. <laughs> it's the best excuse for drinking I've ever heard. But, <laughs> These guys are there. These are students in Brighton. They're in somewhere. I can get to them. Look, they're there. They're out drinking. They're having coffee. So it's easy for me to find and recruit them. If you're also operating in a multi-channel, multi-device world, here's a tip for you. Have a diary study. Imagine if you kept a diary of someone using your product and all the other products you used and where they went and who they called and what websites they went to. Well, you can. It's called a diary. Amazing, right? And here's a piece of diary software that's being used in a multi-channel diary study for Spotify. And the amazing thing that they found is they get all this rich information. Wow, we can see what equipment the person's got. We can see how smelly and dirty their bedroom is. We can see what shit music they're listening to. But the important thing is, is it fills in all this richness about people's context. So a contextual diary study can be really important if you're a multi-channel uh, operator. Have a read. If you don't have session recording and you don't know what it is, go get some. Decibel Insight and Hotjar are very cheap. There's even one from Yandex, which is free. I have no idea if this data is going back to the Kremlin and also through to <laughs> Donald Trump, but stranger things have happened, right? <laughs> Sorry, Yandex. Um, hmm. If you're not running regular customer surveys, get one, right? So Survey Gizmo, Google Forms are an excellent way to start. If you want to know how to do really good survey emails and get lots of people to fill them out and then talk to me afterwards. If you don't have voice to customer tools, something like Hotjar will allow you to ask people landing on a page. Why did you come here? What kind of customer are you? Could you not do something? Were you, what was it that nearly stopped you from purchasing with us today? Ask people shit, you know, get questions from them. These are great tools. Oh, copy skills. See, when we're looking at the composition of the teams in Booking.com, right? You notice there was a copywriter in every team, right? That should be a, a clue to you. It's really vital, right? This is what happens when you let developers write the copy for the error messages on the site. Invalid characters. And you get this, your password is weak. <laughs> weak, you weak human. You know, it's like, what a horrible thing to say. You Pitiful pinhead password. <laughs> so stop asking to people to fill in by writing copy. It's a real job. Give it to someone. Bad copy in your site costs more money than hiring someone, and actually hiring someone will make tens or hundreds of times that cost. That's why Booking have copywriters in there. Now, of all the A-B tests I've run, two-thirds of the big lifts came from words, right? Not playing around with the pictures. Number nine, you need to invest in Google Analytics. Google Analytics is free, it's a wonderful product, but just like your car, 
will not run without regular tires or oil changes, your analytics will not run without love. So put budget into optimizing your analytics and getting it set up correctly, and it transforms the work of everybody in the company, not just you. It's like writing a love note to your future self. Dear Craig, I thought you'd be fed up with shit data by now, which is why I've done all this stuff to fix it so that you could have a better future. Craig from the past, love. That's it, do it today. Start writing that note to yourself. If you don't have form analytics, Simo will tell you how to do it with Google Analytics and all these packages that will let you install it. But you go from a position of scratch in your head. Why won't they get through the whole form step? But actually, it's one field where the drop-off is. It's the phone number field. And why is that? Because we didn't tell them why we wanted their phone number. They thought we wanted their phone number so we could telemarket to them 24-7. But actually, it was because there was a problem delivering your order, then we'll call you. And people go, oh, that's all right then. Oh, I thought you were gonna like spam me and call me at all hours of day and night. And they might still do that, but the whole point is, is you can assuage that fear that's there by putting the copy there. Add form analytics. You have no idea how long it took to find this picture. These are two slugs fighting, okay? <laughs> if your website looks like this, then you need these tools. First off, if you're doing anything in your office, turn off the Wi-Fi. Don't have the Wi-Fi on phones and tablets. Have a shitty 3G signal. You know, th this is what, uh, a great way of getting people to focus a little bit. Talked about the Google Page Speed Index and also webpagetest.org, absolutely brilliant. There's also a mobile performance checker from Akamai there, please use it. Even better than this is, imagine you can go into Google Analytics and get a list of pages that really suck, have a lot of traffic, and are really slow on your site, well, you can. That report template will give you the data that you need to find your suckiest pages on your website. <laughs> so there's your optimization power-ups. The interesting quote here from Mr. Mandelbrot is the order doesn't come by itself. All these things that you see have been the action of millions of years of evolution or wind or forces of nature, right? That stuff just doesn't arrive. You look at it and you think, oh, that's neat, right? But there's a history behind it. And the interesting thing it says here are clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, coastlines are not circles, and bark is not smooth. But the interesting thing is you can take this big river tributary and the more you zoom into it, the more you'll see more little rivers and more little rivers all the way down, right, until they're tiny little streams. And that's the thing about these patterns. Those tiny little atomic units get added together to make pages and steps and experiences and flows. So you have to see the big picture, the macro of the whole system of the experience knitted together, but you also have to have that tiny micro eye to look at the postcode lookup field to make sure it's optimal because inhabiting both of these places, the micro and the macro, is how you get the best out of this optimization work. And the problem is, it is difficult to solve problems, a big business problem or a conversion problem or a user experience problem, if you don't understand anything about it. If you don't have any data or research, then it's gonna be really difficult to fix. And what I want to do over time is, I have all these dendritic futures. You know, I, I really want to end up here, but I seem to keep ending up shit creek, down paddling up shit creek, somewhere down here. I want to be on this pathway, I don't want to be on this one. But it's really important here because this is what it's about. Back to that window display. If we are to survive, we have to stop wasting money on things that don't work, cause more harm than good, or aren't actually needed. This is a quote from the National Health Service. And the reason it's important is because people are gonna fucking die unless they sort this problem out. And the same is true on your website. Your company is gonna die or your customers are gonna get knee panned like I did earlier on. So we need to solve these things. And what he said here is even the most simple interface, even when you see a really cool checkout, you think, oh, it's so simple, I could have just knocked that up in a lunch hour, right? 
It's so easy to do, but actually the stuff that is phenomenally simple and works really well and converts highly is incredibly hard work to get right, a lot of effort, right? So think about the work that went into even the most simple interfaces and you understand the scale of the problem. But you see, if you want to go back to the old way of doing things where you're just fucking guessing all the time and consulting your crystal ball or someone's opinion is running the show, then feel free. But hopefully the checklist that I gave you and the resources in the deck will stop you from suffering from this problem. So thank you very much for your time today. <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, there's a couple of questions um, uh, digital as well, but we are, uh, we are getting to the end of the day and I, and I want to protect people's energy and their space to, um, uh, to um, uh, just to get a turnaround for tonight. So, uh, but Craig will be there this evening, drinks and some food. So uh, find him and have a chat and get out and find out more. But please join me again in thanking Craig. Thank you. Thank you.